Hey, hey, hey! My name's Hellions the Scripted, or Nephilim if you'd prefer. This is the third instalment of me reading the wonderful Mulan AU fanfiction written by XX Cypress Minerva XX entitled Eijiro. This week has been extremely exciting, being that I had to get ready for a con I'll be attending on Saturday, Saturday the 14th of August 2021. Unfortunately, this chapter will not be introducing the character who I'm cosplaying, Denki Kaminari, but that will come in due time. With that being said, the summary of this chapter is as followed. Please, keep them safe. Never mind me, just keep them safe. His reflection seems to glare at him as he leaves the temple, leaving muddy tracks behind him. Knowing what's going to happen in this chapter, let's hope I can keep my composure. I'd advise tissues, but that's just my opinion. Now I implore you to sit back and relax whilst I read to you. Chapter 3. On My Honour. Boom! The drum beat is closer this time, and Adro can't help but wince. The loud sound sends a vibration through his body, and through Tamaki's bangs. He can see a dark and serious look pass over his brother's face. Boom! What is that? He shouts over the drum. Tamaki's grip loosens as they fall in with the flood of people thundering towards the square. His brother's eyes are panicked, flashing right to left over the sea of people. No doubt he was searching for their father, Togata. Boom! Th th that's a war drum! A girl's voice cries, her voice thick as if she's been crying. A what? We're being invaded now? Wait, I'm gonna fall, slow down! A boy's voice shouts, but the panicked footsteps don't cease. BOOM! WE'RE GONNA DIE! <laughs> a child wails. THIS IS THE END! Another chimes in. EVERYBODY LISTEN! EVERYTHING'S FINE! The stern voice startles the crowd, and the people in front of the two brothers skid to a stop. Heads whip around to stare at the boy pressed up against a window. His blue hair whips in the wind, and his glasses sat askew on his rectangular-shaped face as he clutches the window pane, and Adro can hear a few snickers coming from the back. He looked like an exit sign. It's the Imperial Guard! We're in no danger! The boy shouts. The crowd gasps in unison, scrambling to find some order in the chaos they had just caused for themselves. Tamaki grips Adro's wrist as he tugs them toward the square. People walk calmly around them, speaking in hushed voices as the boy continues to shout out instructions. Wow, Adro thinks as he's pulled further into the crowd of people heading toward the square. That calmed down quick. Then the Imperial Guard, mounted on snow-white stallions, burst into the square, coming to a halt as men and women alike started to crowd them. Adro's eyes widened as he saw the Emperor's right hand himself stalk into the village, an angry scowl twisting his face. The familiar beard of flame sputters red as he takes in the side before him and Adro feels Tamaki freeze. Endeavor, the flame hero. The man's turquoise gaze sweeps over the crowd, eyes narrowed into slits. Citizens, I bring you a proclamation from the Imperial City. The League has invaded Hosu City. His brother's nails, though short from being chewed off, dug into his hand. Hosu wasn't that far from where this village stood. If the Imperial Guard was here, the League had to be approaching fast. Adro's heart sinks. They were here for soldiers. By order of Emperor Nezu, one man from every family must serve in the Imperial Army. Endeavor's baritone voice carries far, ringing in his ears. The village erupts in shouts and cries, and from afar he can see Endeavor's large horse nicker nervously. Tamaki's hand tenses, and he begins to murmur something that Adro can't quite make out. He can only shrug when Tamaki looks at him expectantly. Uraraka! A man walks slowly up the aisle with the assistance of a young girl. Adro gasps at the realisation that it was the girl from earlier. She helps her father, who appears to have lost a leg to the last war, retrieve his scroll and stumble back into the crowd. Her round eyes are filled with worry and her face is pinched with something sad. 
Tamaki says something else, lips forming something that Eijiro can't understand. Run. He's telling him to run. To hide from the guards. Toyomitsu! Eijiro's blood turns to ice. The crowd parts in respect as their father limp through the crowd. Eijiro catches sight of Togata, who's clutching their father's cane in a vice grip. The normally smiling, happy, and sunshiny man looks sick to his stomach. No. Eijiro breathes. He steps forward, but Tamaki yanks him back by his arm. His face is screwed into a nonchalant expression, but sheer panic swims behind his navy blue eyes. Tamaki, what? Don't. Tamaki says, voice shaking. If we stop him now... Who cares? Eijiro challenged, prying his brother's hand from his arm. I can't just... Fat gum, Endeavor was saying, thrusting the conscription scroll into their father's face. You've seen better days. It's good to see you too, Endeavor, their father replied, and despite being in pain, he grins at the Emperor's advisor. I am ready to serve the Emperor. Adro hadn't realized it, but his body had started moving. No! He shouts, leaping in front of his father and shielding him from the advisor's piercing glare. You can't make him! He's already fought in your dumb army! Take me instead! Silence! Endeavor snarls, glaring harshly at the small, pathetic child wearing what looked to be a costume made of rags. He shifted his glare to his father, who wobbled without the support of his cane. You'd do well to teach this filth to hold its tongue in the presence of the Emperor's right hand. Adro's crimson eyes burned with rage. He raises his hand, hardened with his quirk. You bastard! Hit him. His arm strains, but he can't move. I said hit him. Put him in his place! Adro trembles, and he growls. Can't you do anything? All he can do is watch as his father pushes his arm to the side, holding a muscled arm in front of his chest. You dishonor me. His father rumbles, teasing smile replaced with a sharp glare. If his son had gone through with striking Endeavor, punishment would be inevitable. Endeavor wasn't known for his generosity, and it was possible Adro would have been executed right where he stood. He would never be able to live with himself if either of his sons died on his account, which is why he would bear his pain and fight in their stead. It didn't matter to him if he died, his sons would be safe. Adro stares at his father incredulously, but he was ignored as Endeavor once again thrust the scroll in his father's face. His father took it, meeting the advisor's harsh glare without fear. Report tomorrow at Wushu Camp! Endeavor grits out, shooting Adro a withering stare. And pray you live to have a son. Adro grits his teeth and says nothing, allowing himself to be led away by his brother, whose horror-stricken face was hidden by his bangs. Yes, sir, his father was saying before he hobbled after them, face somber. Endeavor watches them go, scowling. And then he carries on with his task, forcing the scene away from his mind. It was remarkably easy to forget, considering that stupid brat was so bland-looking. The blue cricket, now released from that horrid cage, chirped from its place on the garden gate softly, watching the stars shine brilliantly in the night sky. Then he hops away to the safety of the bushes. Rain was coming. The crescent moon cast a soft, silvery glow over the small house where a family, though not related by blood, sat eating dinner. Adro stares at his cat Sudan, feeling numb. Hours had passed since the incident at the square, but he can still feel the bitter sting behind his eyes. His brother's grip on his arm, the harsh itch of his quirk hardening the skin of his hand. Why hadn't he done anything? He'd already dishonoured his family by not being able to get betrothed to a girl, and now his father was going to war in his place, and Adro knew in his heart he wouldn't return. Not this time. And everyone knew it. The weight of their father's decision weighs on the two brothers as they try to force themselves to eat the meal Togata had prepared for them. 
the dining room, instead of being full of cheesy jokes and joyous laughter, was absolutely silent. Adro pokes at his food with his chopsticks gloomily. He couldn't eat. Not when his family would be broken into pieces. He had already lost his family before. He had lost his actual father in the last war, and his mother ditched him. Simple as that. Tamaki and Tobisha were getting married. Were planning to move away, actually. If their father died, would he have to stay with them? He'd be even more of a burden than he already was. His gaze skirts to the two of them. Their heads were pressed close together, and they were speaking softly to each other. Tamaki looked distraught, and Togata's reassuring smile didn't reach his eyes. Neither of them had touched their food. There's a loud slurp. Eijiro turns to stare at his father, who slurped his ramen like nothing was wrong. The older man sighs as he sets down his chopsticks, turning to pour tea into Eijiro's cup. It swirls, Gyokuro-scented steam filling his nose. All of them had since changed back into more casual clothes, and his father had insisted Adro place his hero costume in the same cabinet his own was. He told him that when his time came, it would be ready for him. But his time had indeed come, and his father had denied him! Aren't you gonna eat? His father gestures to his uneaten katsudan and Adro shakes his head wordlessly. Why was he trying to act like everything was normal? Was he doing it for him? Or was he trying to distract himself? Adro had caught his father trying to use his quirk. He had heard the legends of his father, how he was able to use his quirk to take in attacks before releasing it in a powerful burst. His father stood in the middle of his room, stuffing his face. He strained, his fists clenched at his sides, his old costume hung loosely on his muscled body, and after a few attempts, a large bulge erupts from his back. His father had looked up hopefully before the bulge deflated, and his father collapsed to the ground, exhausted. His quirk wasn't working. Adro watches dully as his father shrugs, going back to his own meal. His father didn't believe he could pass as a soldier. Of course he understood where his father was coming from. Adro himself would rather die than see his family hurt. Because of his talk with Tamaki, he could admit that freely now. But that doesn't mean his father was right. If Adro died fighting in his stead, the taint on his father's reputation would be wiped clean. Tamaki wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. He could get married without his anxiety about him getting in the way. His, no, their father could live longer to continue protecting Tamaki and Koji and Tokoyami and Togata. Why wouldn't they let him go? Tamaki stayed silent, and Togata whispered something under his breath. He was obviously trying to lighten the mood. It would make more sense for Tamaki to take their father's place, Togata even, considering the fact that he was older and would be marrying into their family. But the both of them didn't say anything, only whispering to each other. Why, why weren't they trying to change their father's mind? Something red and hot floods through his veins, and for a split second, Eijiro wants to scream, to get rid of his pent-up frustration. So he does. He slams his fists on the table, glaring furiously at his father. You shouldn't have to go! Kirishima, please! Togata says, his eyes flickering with worry. Adro! He can see Tamaki reach for him, but he steps back so his hand can't touch him. He wouldn't say anything to change his mind? Fine, he will. There are plenty of men who will fight the League! He shouts, gesturing angrily in Togata's direction before slamming a hand on his own chest. Why can't you let me fight for you? His father only stares at him calmly, yellow eyes flashing. It's an honour to die saving my country and protecting my family, he says simply, slurping more of his ramen. So you'll die for honour! He roars, swiping the dark strands from his face. After everything that's happened today, after all you've taught me! I will die for what's right! His father snaps. He stands, looming over Adro as anger cracks his normally happy features. Any other day, the young man would have been terrified, recoiled from the firm stare. But he stands his ground, glaring harshly back at the same man who raised him to be who he was. Not his actual father, 
not his poor mother. Taishiro Toyomitsu, Fat Gum, the man who didn't believe in him. But you! The strong hands grip his shoulders in a vice grip and Adro yelps, I know my place! His father roars and Adro's mouth clamps shut. His father releases him, slumping back into his seat with his head in his hands. And it's time! His father says warily, not looking at him once. And it's time you learned yours, kid! An invisible hand grips his heart, and he can't form a response. Father? Thunder cracks as Adro throws open the back door and runs into the rain, his dark hair and clothes soon becoming drenched with water. He hears someone shout after him, but the plea to come back falls on deaf ears as Adro begins to cry, his loud sobs making his entire body heave as if he was going to vomit. He felt sick. What had he done? Adro found solace curled up at the foot of the great stone dragon. Rain pours heavily from the sky and Adro's hair and clothes stick to his skin. He shivers violently, pulling the cold, wet fabric closer to his body. He couldn't go inside. Didn't matter if he was freezing out in the rain, he couldn't go back in there. Adro remembers. When he was a little kid, before his dad left to fight, before his mum left him to fend for himself, as a little kid, all he wanted to do was honour his family. He would do races, spelling bees, all kinds of stuff that he thought was honourable. It didn't necessarily mean he was good at any of those things, but it seemed to make his parents happy. So he kept going. And then his father died and his mother left. Adro shakes his head, splattering rain all over his face, as he thinks of the many weeks he wandered through towns in search of her. Why had she left him alone? Didn't she love him? And then he found Tamaki. He was a little older than he was and was so cool, even if he was a little nervous at times. Adro never hesitated to shower him with compliments, to remind him that he was so awesome. He knew Tamaki didn't believe him at first, but after Fat Gum took them in, he thinks it started to sink in a bit more. Now his brother, as he started calling him, had two people who admired him. Tamaki always was worried about him. Adro was smaller than the other kids his age, weaker, but he would always call out the other kids for being mean, no matter what they would do to him after. Beat him up? Fine. Call him names? Okay. He could take it. But this only seemed to worsen his brother's worry for him. He just couldn't stay out of trouble. He couldn't let things go. Tamaki must have known he wouldn't let this go. He wouldn't let their father go. Adro stood, eyes gleaming with determination. He would protect his family, the happiness that they fought for. He would fight for his brother so he wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. He would fight for his and Togata's happiness. He would fight for the father who had raised him when he didn't have to. He would fight for his father who underestimated him. He splashes in puddles as he heads to the family temple. He would need all the guidance he could get, especially where he was going. His feet leave prints from the mud he walks in, but he ignores it. He lights an incense, placing it gently on the dragon incense holder. One of the stone guardians, a yellow rabbit with rosy cheeks and a lightning bolt streak across his back, seems to stare knowingly at him. He sits on his knees and prays deeply to his father's ancestors. Please, keep them safe. Never mind me, just keep them safe. His reflection seems to glare at him as he leaves the temple, leaving muddy tracks behind him. As quietly as he could, Adro snuck back inside his home. It was late and his father, brother and Togata had already retired for the evening, not wishing to upset him even more. For a moment, Adro was grateful. He didn't need them trying to stop him from what he was about to do. He opened the doors of the bathroom as quietly as he could, rummaging around in the cabinet until he found what he needed. Gel and red hair dye. This could work. He had bought it out of spite. Kids at school had teased him for looking bland, so he thought he would just dye his hair and it would stop. He chickened out, and ended up just stuffing it in the back of his cabinet for later. Running the water without bothering to read the instructions because that's how desperate he was, he squirted the dye in and scrubbed as fast as he could, 
He wasn't exactly sure what he was doing, but he'd seen plenty of his friends do it, so he wasn't completely in the dark. It seemed to work. His hair is a vibrant red when he looks in the mirror, which was enough for him. He dries it furiously with a towel, and it seems to make it a more violent shade of red that shocks him when he looks at it. Perfect. He pops the gel open. His hair would be super oily, and he knew the dye would last only so long, but it would work. It had to work. He spikes his hair in sharp spikes that frame his face. It looked bold, confident. He would definitely stand out in a crowd like this. His hands were flushed pink from the hair dye, making him look like a murderer from those horror movies his dad liked. He takes a deep breath and walks to the armory, a bounce in his step, even when he trips over a loose floorboard and almost squirts himself in the face with the hair dye. He was taking it with him, just in case he needed to reapply it later. Hopefully it would be as easy as this time. The author can be seen laughing outside of the family temple because they clearly had no idea how to dye hair but just wanted to move the story along. Please just go with it. Adro averts his gaze from the figure loudly cackling near his family temple, easing the doors of the armory open. He tugs on his hero costume before turning to check his appearance in the mirror. He looked like a totally different person. The hair tied it all together, really. For the first time, his costume actually fit him. On his way to his father's bedroom, he scribbles a note on a scrap of paper. Something he knew his father would understand. Something that had meaning. As soon as he steps into the room, he can't help but be glad he didn't make that flashy or bulky of a costume. He replaces the scroll with the note silently, turning to take one final look at his father. He no doubt wished for an actual son, a son he could be proud of. He smooths his father's blankets over his body before turning and leaving his room, blinking back tears. Tokoyami rears when he catches sight of him, shrieking at his red hands and freakishly red hair. This thing will kill him! He'll get murdered! He'll get- The horse struggles to find the right words as the figure rushes forward, hands outstretched as he shushes him. He'll get horse murdered! Hoarded! Wait. Eijiro strokes Tokoyami's muzzle, trying to calm him down. Shh, Toko, it's me! It's Eijiro! The horse blinks, staring at him with his bleary red eyes. Oh. The now red-headed man grips his reins. Come on, Toko, we have to go. With a puzzled look on his face, the horse allows himself to be led out of the stables. As soon as they're outside, Eijiro hoists himself onto Tokoyami's back. The rain had stopped completely, and crickets buzzed happily from the bushes. The air was warm now. The sun was going to rise any second. I'll bring honour to us all, Ezra announces to the crickets, pulling the reins and spurring Tokoyami to a fast gallop. Thank you so much for watching my video. This week has been one that I didn't expect to be as fun as it was. I got my college results and I got a distinction, and I also was able to get my name legally changed, which is something I've been wanting to do for years. If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments below. All credits go to the original creator of this fanfiction, XX Cypress Minerva XX on AO3. I would highly appreciate it if you gave this video a like and you subscribe to the channel, and you hit the notification bell to be notified of when I next upload. There's no pressure to do so though. Thank you for visiting my cosy corner of the internet. Keep growing, my sunflowers. Mwah.